What's up, fam? It's your boy, Ben Tuan. Welcome to Ben Tuan's Block. This is the fastest five minutes in DeFi. This is our article vlog read through today. We are reading an article written by SFOX, which is an institutional grade trading platform that aggregates their exchanges all in one place. Very interesting perspective considering that this platform and an organization wrote this article. So it is kind of skewed from an institutional perspective. Uh, but I'm going to give you some of my insights. And if you're trying to figure out what's going on with DeFi, where has it been? Where's it going this is a great little article to get into if you're curious about DeFi and you want to learn some of the basics i'll give you some of my insights stay tuned so decentralized finance is an industry growing at a rapid pace with about 610 percent increase in the user base of decentralized lending applications and over 12 billion dollars in locked value since 2018 what they go on to say is that it's very similar to the ico bubble which teams raised 6.9 billion in 2018, didn't really have much to show for it. Around 86% of the ICOs failed, demonstrating the market frenzy surrounding them was somewhat baseless. I think this is a different different time, different thing going on. I see it as the technology side. is It's breaking traditional uh, tools and, and institutions and breaking them down to have kind of this crowdsource, crowd-governed uh, way of, of, of entering into finance. Does DeFi have a future base on fundamentals or is the current boom fueled by mere speculation? It is changing the paradigm in which traditional finance operates, um, where we have custodians who oversee the whole system, essentially. Why not make everyone a custodian that can follow certain sets of guidelines and rules? So what is DeFi for those of you that don't know? Decentralized finance is the use of leaderless financial system to offer and manage financial services through a governance maintained by token holders rather than a central ruling board. Inherent in all of them is the concept of the project has or will have no centralized future, mitigating the risk of corruption and human error in the traditional banking system. Smart contracts, self-executing programs written into the blockchain replace human banking staff in DeFi. And this also cuts down on overhead costs, allowing savings to be passed on to the users. Love that. That's another perfect example of why DeFi works. So let's talk about some of the risk here associated with it. So the ecosystem is arguably vulnerable to sudden price drops leading to a liquidation cascade. So in addition to this, a successful breach of smart contracts holding the assets that secure decentralized loans would also have a major negative impact on the space. So the voting mechanism, the governance token, which is the MKR token maker, is what is used to vote on the protocol. So what happens a lot of times in these DeFi projects is that, yes, the, the decentralized autonomous organization will remain centralized in many aspects, but a lot of them have phases in which they are slowly handing over the power to their community. The reason for that is if there is any kind of issues with the protocol, if there's anything that bugs or coding or anything like that, they have to have a way to be able to fix that. So if the people that are just buying into these DAOs don't really have that experience or know what's going on, they're not gonna be able to make the right decision. So the people that are building this protocol are essentially in control of it still in many aspects. Now in the future, they're trying to wind this down so that it becomes completely decentralized, but you can't just do that ground zero. Funds locked in DeFi are only as secure as the code of their underlying protocols. Smart contract bugs are always a risk in DeFi because it is so brand new. This article kind of rips Ethereum, um, and rightfully so. It's, it's had its issues. But I think with E2.0 coming out, a lot of their mechanisms are going to change, which is going to allow scalability for the ETH network. Earlier this year, there was a lot of network congestion, as you may recall, high gas fees, all of that kind of stuff. Um, what SFOX, the, the writer of this article, was saying is that their institutional grade platform was not affected because they aggregate all of their exchanges. And if one exchange like Max or Deribit go down, you're good because they aggregate all their, their indexes from a bunch of different exchanges. So there's not really a concern when one goes down. DeFi is not improved on traditional finance. That's where I got beef. And I think if you were asked that same question to make that same statement, you know, five, 10 years from now, I think it's going to be a, a lot different story, a lot different story. We're gonna, My vision of the future is that we will have decentralized autonomous organizations running our finance system. Hmm?
I appreciate you guys listening to some of my insights. Hopefully you learned something about DeFi today. This was kind of a DeFi beginner little read through. So you kind of get the knowledge of what's happening in the space, what's been happening, and some of my takes as to why DeFi is going to be part of the future. I appreciate you guys joining in. Make sure you smash the like buttons, hit the notification button so you know when I post the next article read through. I appreciate you guys. Deuces. Thank you.